Good afternoon, everyone, and Karibuni uh, Sana to this uh, webinar. <clears throat> My name is uh, Angela Munga Mwadumbo. I'm uh, the chair lady of the East African Law Society Women Lawyers Committee, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this uh, webinar. Um, today's webinar is uh, very special in several ways. Um, the first way is that this is the first of a series of webinars that will come courtesy of a partnership that is uh, currently in place between the East Africa Law Society and the and Kelin Kenya. Kelin Kenya is the Kenya Legal and Ethical Issues Network on HIV and AIDS. And uh, it is a human rights organization that is based in Kenya, whose core mandate is to protect and promote health related human rights in Kenya by providing legal services and support um, training professionals and communities on health and human rights related issues. They also engage in advocacy campaigns that promote awareness uh, of human rights issues. They also conduct research and influence policy that promotes evidence-based change. So this webinar is um, the partnership today is between ELS, uh, the Women Lawyers Committee, and uh, Kelin Kenya. Please be on the lookout for more exciting webinars, courtesy of this uh, partnership. And uh, today's webinar is also very unique and special in that our attendees will get a free CPD point. We shall discuss more on that after the session. Um, but uh, back to today's topic. Um, it's a very exciting topic because we shall learn about uh, legislating at the regional level. Of course, this being an ELS-sponsored uh, uh, webinar, we are already at a regional level, but have we ever considered what happens at the East African uh, Legislative Assembly? Um, currently, there are several bills pending, and today's focus will be on uh, one of the bills. As we all know, the IALA, that is the East African Regis Legislative Assembly, is currently composed of seven members. We have three of uh, the original members, that is Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, who, who, which countries became members in the year 2000. Then thereafter, in the year 2007, Rwanda and Burundi also became members. Then the ELC also welcomed, some, uh, welcomed uh, South Sudan in 2016, and uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo became a member in the year 2022. So currently, there are seven member states, and each member has, of course, representatives in the assembly. But we shall have a speaker who will take us through how um, a, a brief overview on the lawmaking process at IALA. So today's focus is on the East African Community Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights Bill, which is one of the bills that is pending in the regional um, parliament. So um, in order to understand um, the intricacies, of legislating in the IALA and uh, the intricacies of sexual health and reproductive legislation, we have a very eminent, uh, a panel of very eminent speakers who are all experts in their respective fields. Uh, we have Dr. Evans Ogada, who is a distinguished practitioner and teacher of the law. Uh, he will give us an overview of the legislative process at uh, IALA. And uh, we also have Ms. Uh, Nyokabi Njogu, who is an advocate uh, who specializes in constitutional and administrative law litigation. She will enlighten us on the status of sexual, reproductive, and health rights in the region and the need to have a legal regime concerning the area. And uh, finally, we have uh, Ms. Lena Moyanga, who is an advocate of over 12 years standing, 
whose area of specialty is um, is uh, sexual health and reproductive rights. Uh, so she will take us through um, the impact that the bill, once it is passed into law, the impact that it will have in the region. Uh, and uh, But before I call upon the first uh, speaker, some uh, housekeeping rules, um, feel free to post your comments, reactions, and observations, and even greetings on the Q&A section, uh, sorry, on the chat section. Then um, we are going to have the presenters, the panelists give us their presentation first, then thereafter we are going to have a plenary session. But should you have a question in the course of the presentation, feel free to post it on the Q&A section and uh, you can also indicate who the question is uh, directed to. So as I had uh, mentioned earlier, our first speaker is Dr. Evans Ogada. Um, Dr. Evans Ogada. specializes in uh, in uh, constitutional and administrative law litigation he has handled numerous cases in this area including representing the law society of kenya in 2019 in a petition concerning appointment of judges and two petitions on arbitrary arrests he also teaches law at the university of nairobi school of law he serves uh, regularly on civil society panels on the rule of law and uh, international criminal law. He's also the associate editor with the platform for law, justice, and society, which is a leading socio legal publication in Kenya. He's also very active in the ELS as he's the chairperson of the rule of law committee. Um, Dr. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Lady, Mrs. Madumbo. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. Uh, may I thank uh, the leadership of uh, the East African Law Society, uh, our president, President Fawuz, um, the council members, our CEO, uh, Uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Deretariat uh, staff, uh, led by my good friend, uh, Gabriela Chai and uh, Achilles, who have done a good job to see that we uh, we always move as a, a regional bar. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm cognizant that we have the presence of uh, French speakers here. Uh, we thank them for coming in. Allow me to address them briefly in French. Uh, mes frères, messieurs, uh, mes amis qui viennent de, de pays français, soyez les bienvenus. Je vais continuer en anglais parce que c'est la langue largement parlée dans la région, mais quand même, j'espère que vous allez, um, uh, être, uh, vous allez uh, être ensemble avec nous uh, pendant les, la présentation aujourd'hui. Thank you very much. We hope to be together with our francophone brothers. Basically, I'm here to address uh the issue of legislation uh within uh, the east african uh, region specifically dealing with the east african legislative assembly now the issue of law instruments and instruments claiming the capacity of law within the region cannot only be looked at from the present uh, the prism of the East Africa Legislative Assembly alone. For this reason, that the members, the original members, as Mrs. Mwadumbo had earlier alluded to, in their wisdom or not, decided that uh, the council, the council is one of the organs of uh, uh, the ESC, the East African Community, also be bequeathed some law-making capacity. Members that came in later and members 
members that acceded to the Trinity, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, DRC Congo, South Sudan, agreed to what was originally crafted by the original members. Now, that makes it a binding provision for members currently of the East African community. Now, a read of Article 14D of the treaty will give, will, will show the, uh, 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 the power conferred on the ESC Council. And that is the power to make regulations, issue directives, uh, take decisions, make recommendations, and give opinions in accordance with the provisions of the treaty. Uh, a read of Article 41G will also give the Council a power to make staff rules and regulations and financial rules and regulations for the community. Now, read those provisions with Article 14.5 which says that the regulations and directives made by the council under this treaty shall be published in the community gazette and that such regulations and directives shall come into force on the date of publication, which means that whatever direct, whatever um, direct uh, regulations that are made by the council and published in the community gazette will bind us as of law. Now, with regards to the East Africa Legislative Assembly, IALA, which was created under Article 9 of the ESC Treaty, the e East Africa Legislative Assembly, uh, the short form for it is IALA, is created. Article 49.1 of the treaty stipulates that IALA is the legislative organ of the community. Article 59 of um, the treaty says that subject to rules of procedure, any member of the IALA assembly may propose any motion or introduce a bill in the assembly. So the preliminary point to establishing, to uh, bringing in law, an act of the community starts with an introduction in the assembly by any member. Article 62 of the East Africa Community Treaty says that every bill that has been duly passed and assented to shall be styled as an act of the community. So each bill that has been properly introduced and has gone through the stages that we shall look at briefly and has been assented to by all the heads of state, uh, the members of the summit, the summit is an organ of the ESC community that becomes an act of the community. It becomes one of the laws of the East Africa community. Article 63 of the um, East Africa Community Treaty says that heads of state may assent or may withhold their assent to a bill of the assembly. Basically, those of us who are uh, students of the common law system, this will be familiar to us that the head of state, the head of government can either sign onto a bill or uh, reject a bill and therefore not sign on it. And that will require that the bill is sent back to uh, the assembly uh, with comments. This is the reason why we have not signed on the bill. That is very common for us who uh, are familiar with the common law system. That is a, um, a method, a formula that we have borrowed from the Commonwealth uh, system of law and is being practiced. For, for an overview of what it entails in terms of legislation at the assembly, 
I will invite us to look at chapter 12, Roman 12 of the ESC treaty. It has a layered number of requirements, uh, procedures that must be adhered to in terms of enacting uh, an act of the community. From the bill stage leading to what we call the act of the community after it has been signed by the various heads of state and the signature must be of all members of the summit so that even if one member rejects it that um, uh, particular bill will not succeed it will not gain um, uh, the, the, the status of the act of community basically i'll want to go through uh, salient provisions and owing to time i'll just touch on them we certainly will be encouraged to read them for a better understanding of the legislative process number one before um, introduction to the assembly it is required that each and every bill be printed and published in the gazette so it is a requirement that the clerk will cause a bill to be printed and published in the community uh, gazette before its introduction in the assembly, IALA. Secondly, at Article 61.2, on the publication of the bill in the gazette, the clerk is required to dispatch a copy of that bill to each and every member. So the clerk will send a copy of the bill in a language that is understandable to these members, a copy of that particular bill in question. The clerk will send it to DRC in French, to Burundi in French, to Rwanda in English and French, to the rest of us members, the Anglophone members in English, to Tanzania certainly, I hope, in, in Kiswahili and English. Now, I want you to note this, that at Article 62 of the treaty, there are certain bills that may be urgent and they need to be passed quickly to deal with an urgent question. This bill can be dealt with without the requirement of publication as required in Article 61. So, Article 62 of the treaty will uh, obviate the need for publication. And an urgent uh, bill at Article 62 two will be dealt with in a day. So members can sit within a day and go through the whole process without the requirements of uh, the three stages in an ordinary bill. We will look at the three stages briefly. So members can be taken through a bill without publication and within a day and without the formal requirements of the various sittings. That is at Article 62.2. Article uh, 63 is very important. And this actually is something that those of us in the civil society space, uh, concerned citizens, need to watch out for that whatever bill that is introduced in the assembly should not derogate from human rights uh, provisions. And that provision is important for these ladies and gentlemen, that that bill is required to not derogate from a good number of uh, human rights instruments, not only the African Charter, but the ICCPR and any other human instrument that any country has ratified. So any instrument of human rights that any member has ratified, and you think that a bill has departed from human rights obligations in those treaties, please invoke rule 63 of uh, the ESC treaty and have that bill nullified for departing from the human rights norm uh, entered into by that member state from departing from the ICCPR, the African Charter, 
and indeed any other major uh, uh, um, norm of human rights that you can be identified. Another important thing is that the bill after introduction is to be read three times prior to being passed. That you will find under Rule 65. So we have the first reading, that is at Rule 66, uh, Rule 66 of uh, uh, the Yala Rules, uh, Yala Rules of uh, Procedure. A bill will be read three times. Rule 65, Yala Rules of Procedure. Rule 66 that deals with the first reading, and during the first reading we will have the sectoral committee stage the committee stage that is in the committee that is deals with a specific question will interrogate be, the bill make comments propose amendments that will be during the first reading then we will move to the second reading the second reading is dealt with under rule 68 of the yala procedures uh yala uh, uh parliamentary procedures now the second reading will bring in uh the committee of the whole the whole house will now look at um this particular bill and either adopt it recommend recommend changes or reject it that is the committee of the whole that will happen uh, during the second reading then we have the final reading, which is uh, the third reading that is governed by Rule 71. Rule 71, third reading, we either look at the bill in terms of does it comply with what we had recommended as a whole house? Uh, do we need to reject it? Do we pass it on to the heads of state for signature? Remember, the heads of state have to sign on it entirely, or else, if one of those members, member heads of uh, members of the summit, reject this bill, that bill would not have passed. Ladies and gentlemen, owing to time, I hope to stop here. Uh, that is essentially uh, the procedure of legislation at Yala. I go back to where I started: legislation and law-creating instruments are not only the preserve of the Yala Assembly, the council can also make uh, law uh, binding obligations, and that is a power and authority granted under Article 14 of the, the, the treaty. Uh, Mrs. Madumbo, thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, members, as you have heard, when I said that uh, our panel was made up of eminent speakers, I was very right. Uh, of course, Dr. Ogada would have given the entire presentation in French. We had to request very humbly that he gives the presentation in English. Um, before we move on to the next, uh, just our comments, um, observations, and greetings and reactions in the chat section. And let us just limit the QA section for questions that um, appertain to the presentation so that it becomes easier for the speakers to track the questions and to answer. And another reminder, if you have a specific question for a specific um, speaker, you can also indicate that. So we have been uh, given the overview of the lawmaking process. Uh, we might, uh, we may or may not give a quick quiz at the end to gauge our comprehension, uh, but that one is still being discussed by management. Um, let us move on to the second speaker, and that is uh, Ms. Nyokabi Njogu, who is uh, an advocate working at uh, KELIN, that is Kenya Legal and Ethical Issues Network on HIV and AIDS. She's an advocate of the High Court of Kenya and a network lawyer of the Feminist uh, Litigation Network of 
the Initiative for Strategic Litigation in Africa, through which uh, she researches and undertakes strategic litigation on uh, human rights. She will enlighten us on the status of the sexual, reproductive, and health rights uh, within the region and the need to have a legal regime governing the area. Uh, Ms. Nyokabi, the floor is yours. Or is it the screen is yours? Uh, thank you, Mrs. Madumbo. I do believe the screen is mine. I hope colleagues can hear me. Mrs. Madumbo, maybe you can just confirm. Um, yes, we can we can hear you. Feel free to greet us in French also. <laughs> uh, bonjour, uh, my colleague. <laughs> I, I, unfortunately, my, my French, when I stopped it a few years ago, now is only limited to uh, survival skills. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ogada, uh, for setting us off on that very incisive note, which has also been a learning for uh, us here at Kellyn as well. So my brief here today is, is really, it's, it's, it's very limited just to speak through why do we need a law to govern SRHR issues within uh, our community. So first in terms of grounding, we know that uh, the treaty that establishes the community or that, that brings us all together uh, calls for the enhance, enhancement of the role of women in cultural, social, political, economic, and technological developments. Um, we say, or at least it is presumed, that this treaty is also founded on principles including democracy, the rule of law, um, social justice, equal opportunities, and gender equality. Um, therefore, the question of SRHR cannot be removed from the question of the treaty. Uh, there is a deliberate uh, and, uh, uh, and a directive within Article 118 of the treaty requiring partner states to harmonize their national health policies, uh, as well as their regulations and the promotion of exchange of information amongst themselves on health issues to ensure that there's the achievement of quality health within the community. And of course, um, the, the question of reproductive, sexual and reproductive health then uh, is anchored there. And uh, beyond that, under Article 121 of the treaty, uh, states must enact a legislative framework or take many other measures to ensure that there is participation of women in decision making, to eliminate harmful cultural practices, as well as eliminate anything that, that can discriminate against women. Uh, and uh, while the gender, the, the gender equality framework, of course, usually we just think of it as women, we do know that women are not homogeneous and there are many people who identify as women who face multiple forms of discrimination. Um, beyond that, the partner states are also uh, members of other various uh, bodies, including the UN, and have indicated that they will abide by certain goals or development goals that we all subscribe to, specifically around um, gender equality and the empowerment of girls and women. And the primary focus here is to make, ensure that there's an elimination of discrimination against um, women and girls. And here we must, of course, pause to remember that any form of sexual and gender-based violence is a form of discrimination against women. Uh, there's also a, a positive obligation to ensure that there's elimination of violence and elimination of all harmful cultural practices, including child marriage, including female gen genital mutilation. Um, we also have to ensure that there is the recognition of unpaid care or domestic work, as well as the ensuring the women's partic participation and leadership in decision ma making. And of course, the primary of all this is to ensure universal access towards sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, we know that sexual and reproductive health rights disproportionately affect adolescents and young, and young people. So in as much as they affect all everybody, but we do know that because of the various vulnerabilities that adolescents or young people face, they, they then are, they face this multiple discrimination. So one is lack of sexual reproductive health information or services. So this is seen by teen pregnancies, which are also a form of violence in itself because of how the adolescent got pregnant or what happens after the young person got pregnant. 
Then there's a question of child marriages. Um, there are some statistics that I'd prepare to share with you, but I can share the slide later in terms of how one in every four girls is married by the time she has reached the age of 18 or she's in a, some form of cohabiting relationship or is even the head of a household. Then there's the, a disproportionate amount of sexual and gender-based violence. And um, beyond this, there's of course the high burden of HIV infection and AIDS-related deaths. And then the question of unsafe abortion, um, which uh, cuts across all the partner states, uh, which has led to an increased, um, an, an increased level of, of, of maternal uh, mortality. So in terms of, again, the status, so we know women, young people, and adolescents, they're not homogeneous. Um, all these women have different needs, uh, they have different experiences, and especially in a, in a community as vast as ours, especially now with the latest addition of the DRC, it's, uh, it's safe to say that we, there's, the women in Kenya are not going to face the same uh, forms of discrimination that they will in, in other parts of the country. Then there's, so there's those, all these vulnerable subpopulations that are within this group. Uh, sexual and gender uh, minorities, many of whom are not even recognized. We've seen the backlash uh, after the ruling of the Supreme Court here in Kenya. We've seen what is happening in our neighbor Uganda. We've seen in Tanzania that um, uh, forced testing has, has again uh, resurfaced. So within the framework of SRHR, what does it mean for people who identify either sexual minorities or gender minorities to receive access to health? Uh, of course, there's a question of persons who are disabled or persons with disabilities. Uh, we live also in a country, in a region that is uh, plagued with the political unrest. So this has meant that there, we've got internally displaced persons and we've got um, uh, refugees who live amongst us who still need services because um, they are still alive. Uh, we've got persons living with HIV and again, this can be seen between, can, 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 there can be a subpopulation here between the older people and the younger people who, are, who live with, H, uh, with HIV. On top of that, of course, the SRHR issues are exacerbated by disasters. Uh, this part of the world has been dramatically affected by climate change. Uh, sorry about that that has been dramatically affected by climate change, by pandemics, which we're just recently emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic, but we are still dealing with the, the, the residual effects of what that has meant for, the la for us for the last three years. Uh, we are, many of us are still at war or are still in very violent situations. Um, the East Africa Legislative Assembly itself has actually noted that member states are lagging behind in their own agreed upon targets in terms of reproductive health and HIV. And it's done some research in terms of um, a scorecard based on some specific indicators that are agreed upon by the, by the partner states. And the results are shocking in terms, well, they're shocking, they are, they're sobering and they're quite solemn. In terms of the question of numbers, uh, people living with HIV, for example, in Burundi, we've got up to 82,000, but of course, most of these are, are women at 44,000. Uh, Kenya, the situation is the same. We have about 1.6 million as at 2020 estimates. And of these, uh, at least 910,000 are women. So that's at least two thirds are women who are, who are over 15. So the prevalence of men to women is actually about something like 4.7. Uh, 4 um, it's the same in uh, Tanzania, at least the trend, uh, where we've got about 880,000, sorry, 1.6 million also, and 880,000 of those are women. Uh, and, and this is something that plays across the entire spectrum, of the, or at least all the partner states, where women are more affected uh, by, by HIV, and I'm using, only using HIV as, as one of the indicators. Uh, in terms of even knowledge, in terms of um, the use of uh, contraception or condoms within uh, non-marital or non-cohabiting unions, we've got only 29% of women say that they are accessing some form of contraception. 
uh, similarly, that, that is um, in Burundi. In Kenya, we've got only 40% who say that they're able to access some form of contraception. Uh, in terms of knowledge on HIV, the trend is the same. It's very low, with only 52% of women in Burundi saying that they are able to access uh, uh, knowledge, knowledge prevention, knowledge and prevention services towards HIV, as opposed to 54% of men. So while the men are more, there's still a significant unmet need in terms of uh, either knowledge or services, actual commodities and uh, access to facilities. Um, generally, uh, across the partner states, we see that one in four married women in East Africa have an unmet need for, for contraception. Uh, three out of four abortions are unsafe, meaning they are not carried out in uh, uh, by a, a trained healthcare professional or in a safe and, and secure environment. And what this has done, of course, is that has recreated an environment where there is a high maternal mortality or in immense uh, complications arising out of unsafe abortions. Six out of 10 people living with HIV are actually female. And then in, in the midst of all this, we still have continued contestations in terms of SRHR information, in terms of uh, access to services. And of course, now we now see the, how the lack of recognition of section, sexual and gender-based minorities is, is facing out. And what this has meant is that there's continued violence uh, and even death of these people. And this, these are statistics, again, published by the community itself in 2019. So cross-cutting across all the partner states, states, we see there's a lack of SRHR information and services. There's a continued heightened uh, discrimination, uh, sometimes at the instigation of the state itself, by uh, against women, against sexual and gender-based minorities, and even against women, there's the different classifications of how we how we term the, the person women. Uh, governments are simply not doing their duty in ensuring that they are meeting the treaty obligations or indeed any other human rights obligation that they are supposed to. And uh, for example, in Kenya, in the past year, because of the effects of the pandemic and because of the lack of information that's been given to people, we've seen increasing HIV rates, particularly uh, uh, around young people and uh, in sexual, uh, in terms of uh, minorities. So we do have a policy framework. Um, it's not as robust as it is at individual partner states. So for example, we've got the ESC policy guidelines, uh, which are supposed to run at least guide, provide guidance to within the partner states from 2016 to 2013. We've got, also got a strategic plan, which has just come to an end, and which is now pending renewal for the, the, com the community. But now we've also got the comprehensive regional integrated sexual reproductive uh, maternal newborn HIV and TB program. So there's this mashup of all these things that are supposed to be happening, put in one policy document. This is 2022 to 2027. These three documents that I've just mentioned actually speak to continued cooperation integration amongst the partner states in SRHR and HIV. Uh, and then on top of that, we've got the ESC HIV and, uh, HIV and AIDS Management Act. This is a 2016 act. Um, I beg your pardon, 2012 act that um, has been signed, was signed by all the partner states at that time and uh, provides for a very robust uh, legal framework for access to HIV services. But there is need, of course, to see SRHR even beyond just HIV because um, none of us live single issue lives, people may be living with HIV, but they have many other sexual and reproductive health needs that must be met and for which partner states have an obligation. So why the law? There's generally a complete there's a neglect within the partner states around SRHR services through the EAC. It, of course, ranges. In places like South Sudan, the statistics are more dire than they are here in Kenya. But in Kenya, we still see that even where we've gotten, for example, progressive judgments, or we, uh, well, we are still going to court to fight for agitate for certain things, they still need to ensure that even court judgments are complied with and that it would help to have a law that can speak to some of uh, these things without necessarily always having to go to court. The second thing is that it's our treaty obligation to cooperate in health matters, and in particular, uh, reproductive health. 
Then there's just generally a need for harmonization of national laws and policies for quality health frameworks within the community. We've seen the work, this work through the HIV IANCA. Um, and this particular law also informed how the specific partner states also came up with their own HIV Prevention and Control Act. So there's a lesson to be learned there. And a law can also facilitate or at least put, remove legal barriers that can then lead us to universal access towards HIV SRHR and by, especially by integrating reproductive health within the legal frameworks. More than that, uh, a regional response um, has tracks progress because it creates a new uniform front through which uh, SRHR issues can be addressed. And then we have the added uh, layer of accountability, being able to, be, to hold partners, each other accountable, either through uh, mechanisms or even at partner state level. And this, of course, would just lead to a strengthening of systems towards universal uh, access to SRHR services, which again, like I've stated, is an actual treaty obligation. Um, some of the things that this robust framework that we advocate for should must cover uh, issues like public participation to ensure that quality services are actually meeting the SRH needs of the people who it's claiming to serve. Uh, there's a very highly contested issue of uh, provision of safe abortion. Uh, this is something that is now an, an emergent issue because women and girls or other people, or, I mean, gender people who are trying to access abortions and they're unable to are dying because of legal barriers and social barriers to safe and legal abortion. Then there's a question, of course, of sexual and gender-based violence, which has been legislated in different ways across the partner states. So for example, here in Kenya, we do not necessarily recognize marital rape as a sexual offense within the within our Sexual Offenses Act, which is which can be a barrier for, for people who want to report that. But this is one of the things that a sexual reproductive health law at the ESC level can actually um, uh, talk on or legislate on. And then there's, of course, the use of technology. We are in a space where we are seeing additional technologies through which uh, women are able to exercise their, their reproductive rights, uh, help um, uh, expanded access to information because of the use of technology. And then of course, now we have more e-health interventions and this is now the question of data protection. So this is something that um, a robust framework can actually address and ensure that we are utilizing technology as a, as a means to facilitate access, universal access to sexual and reproductive health. Then of course, there's a question of access to medicines and commodities. Uh, I know in places like Uganda and Kenya, access to commodities is a significant issue, particularly for vulnerable communities like uh, key populations or for persons living with HIV. Uh, we even without having uh, a, a directive on what government obligations should be around uh, access to medication. So this is a, a plug, a, a gap that the the law could fill in. Um, in in addition to that, we do know that many partner states have signed on to international conventions or regional um, legislative regional frameworks. Let's say, for example, the Maputo Protocol, but they've done so with reservations. And uh, a regional law can help us bridge some of these gaps in terms of the in terms of the regional frameworks. Then, generally, the questions of uh, services, good quality, affordable, non-stigmatizing gender affirming care um, to ensure that the uh, prevalence of harmful cultural practices is done away with, to ensure that uh, there's increased access uh, to services, including information, as well as ensuring that uh, previously excluded groups, groups who may need extra support or additional support then have a, a legislative framework which they can, they can use for uh, to agitate for those rights. Then there is added layer in terms of accountability. How are these things being financed? Um, how can we then use the EAC structures to ensure this compliance, uh, or even to advocate for stretch, strength and protection through courts uh, or through the the political uh, means, like the Council of Ministers. Um, 
this has been a learning lesson also for us where we've seen uh, a lot like the East Africa Community uh, HIV and AIDS Management Act is actually uh, can be litigated against within our domestic frameworks. And that's one of the things that we can actually push for when we are pushing for a, a more robust framework for sexual and reproductive health rights. And that's generally there's alignment with international human rights standards through which all of us um, to which all of us are hoping that uh, can come out of this assembly. Uh, Mrs. Madumbo, perhaps I can stop there in case there are any comments. I can see the floor to um, Mrs. Madumbo. Um, yes, uh, thank you. Yes, yes. Um, can you hear me now? Um, thank you very much, uh, Nyokabi. Uh, for the presentation, and uh, I can see on the chat section there is someone requesting that you repeat the names of uh, the documents that you have uh, referred to. Maybe as you collate the list, I will call upon the next speaker, and that is Ms. Uh, Lena Muyanga. Lena Muyanga is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya with over 12 years experience and her speciality is uh, sexual uh, health, reproductive and health rights. Uh, she, the highlights of the East Africa community um, sexual health rights bill and the impact it will have on in the entire region should it be passed. She will also debunk uh, some of the myths that are associated with the bill. Um, Ms. Moyanga, Karimsana. Oh, as, and remember, Dr. Tari has set the pace, so you will need to greet us in French, or at least say something in French. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, my name is Ngena Moyanga. I, I do work with um, Kelin. Um, Angela, to your challenge about saying something in French, I might swallow my tongue in the process. Please allow me to abstain from it. Um, diving straight into it, please allow me to share my screen. Um, hmm. Here we are. As um, so, um, Ms. Um, just a minute. Um, as Ms. Muyanga is setting up a screen, just a reminder, uh, we have gotten information that some some of some members are trying to join the session, but they are getting error messages. As we are working on that and expanding capacity, we can uh, advise our friends to follow this uh, webinar because it is streaming live on the. ELS uh, Facebook platform, and that is uh, um, East Africa Law Society. So members who might not be present here, um, let's advise them to share, to follow the presentation on uh, Facebook as we work on the said challenge. Um, Lena, back to you. Thank you so much. Um, colleagues, I would like to thank the previous speakers who've gone before me for making good on time and um, allowing me to speak some more. <laughs> so diving right into it, I think we are all making an assumption that we do know what sexual and reproductive health rights actually is. So allow me to um, just share a very brief definition, but not belabor the point. But in a nutshell, SRHR can be described to be rights that are fundamental to health, well-being, gender equality, democracy, peace, security, and sustainable development. Um, it is grounded on the right and ability of all individuals to decide over their own bodies and to live healthy and productive lives. So um, by way of introduction, the EAC SRHR bill um, was introduced into the fourth East African Legislative Assembly in 2021. It's premised on the treaty, um, Article 118 of the Treaty for the Establishment of the EAC, um, which provides for cooperation in health and promoting the management of health delivery systems. 
the bill, when we call it the ESC SRH bill, um, the bill actually has a long form title, as you can see there on my slide. It is called an act of the community to protect and facilitate the attainment of life costs, sexual and reproductive health and rights for all persons in the community. It goes ahead to say that it is meant to provide for the progressive um, realization of integrated sexual and reproductive health information and services as part of universal health coverage of each partner state in order to prohibit harmful practices from the community and provide for related matters. It is quite a mouthful. So it's just popularly abbreviated as the EAC, SRH bill. So we did a pictorial for you um, just to show what the bill covers. Um, you can see um, the subsections of the bill include gender-based violence, men's reproductive health. We will take a look at each, um, each component and what the bill provides for. Um, it also provides for subfertility and infertility because there are various stages and um, process, can I say stages? and uh, of infertility. The bill also looks at maternal health, it looks at contraception, and it does look at contraception from both a male and female perspective. The bill touches on CSE, and that is comprehensive sex education for the adolescent and youth. The bill touches on uh, menstrual hygiene, ending harmful practices, HIV, as well as comprehensive abortion care. So, um, Provisions for Adolescent and Youth, CSC. So CSC, Comprehensive Sex Education, can be defined to be the main international framework used for sexuality education globally today. It is um, based and focuses on a school-based setting, and the bill provides for age-appropriate comprehensive sex education. Currently, this is a very controversial topic because um, opponents of comprehensive sex education focus or try to actually create um, misinformation that people are seeking to teach children how to have sex. But that is not the case. The um, comprehensive sex education basically teaches youth manners of protecting themselves, including abstaining, and provides all other relevant age appropriate. What you would tell a four-year-old is not what you'd tell a 17-year-old. So comprehensive sex education also takes into account the re evolving capacity of minors and what they are able to comprehend and what you'd be telling an older child is not what you'll be telling a younger child. It is important to also question and look into um, the intersectionality of education and sexual and reproductive health rights. Why is CSC based um, or premised on schools? Why is it set on, um, why is it based off of a school setting? One, it is because schools are some of uh, places where distressing concerns relating to SRH are originate, including sexual abuse, spread of HIV and um, STIs. Um, when adolescents get pregnant, when adolescents are dealing with sexual abuse and early marriage, um, the education system is overburdened, as well as um, HIV. All these things are negatively influence um, a student's academic achievement. I will give an example of Kenya where exams, the transition exams from, high, from primary school to secondary school, and from secondary school to college and or university, those exams are very key in our setting. Therefore, if you are dealing with something like an unwanted pregnancy, it impacts on your performance and your subsequent, subsequent transition to the other stages that you need to move to. And also, it is important to have um, CSE, comprehensive sex education, because of the harmful effects of sexual abuse on survivors. I will also give another example based off of our Kenyan setting. We currently are experiencing what is called um, the triple threat to adolescents. One, um, it is sexual and gender-based violence, a high rate of teen pregnancies, as well as HIV and AIDS. What this has happened and what this has caused is that for the first time in 10 years in Kenya, our rate in HIV has actually spiked. 
for the first time in 10 years, and this is solely being attributed to the rise of um, HIV among adolescents. Another um, area that the bill touches on is menstrual health and hygiene. The bill mandates governments um, to ensure that young girls and women have access to proper menstrual hygiene that includes uh, disposable and reusable sanitary towels, clean um, environments and facilities, and also states are obligated to establish, to establish menstrual hygiene spaces that are clean, safe, and dignified. We know that in uh, areas where poverty is rampant, girls actually miss school due when they are on their menses. When it comes to men's reproductive health, um, the bill touches on the need to have um, gender-based violence provisions that also covers men. The example we always like giving is if you as a man, wherever you're seated, imagine going to a police station and reporting that your wife has assaulted you. In the Kenyan setting, the police would laugh you, laugh you off the police station. Um, they would call each other and ridicule you. So that has um, given rise to a culture where men do not report gender-based violence against them. The bill mandates states to engage boys and men in prevention and elimination of SGBV within the EAC community. Um, the bill also mandates states to um, deal with harmful practices um, that cover any behavior, attitude, or practice which negatively affect not only women and girls, but boys and men as well. Partner states are also obligated to offer provider-initiated information and develop programs that include reproductive health care services for men that include things like screening and treatment of disorders of the male reproductive system, sexual dysfunctions, infertility, urological diseases, and other um, common sexual and reproductive health um, diseases and disorders. And the bill also mandates for information and counseling on managing andropause and preconception information. Um, here, it is common to imagine or the myth that is popularly perpetuated in our setup is that conception issues and preconception only lies with women, but it also does lie with men, but this is normally not dealt with. When it comes to contraceptives, um, in the SRHR sector, contraceptives are viewed from the triple AQ model. Um, is contraceptive easily available, accessible? Is it acceptable? And is it of high quality? So when it comes to availability, um, family planning, the existence of family planning, education, information, and services has to be in sufficient quantity, and it includes prevention methods. So the bill under this model, what the bill has done is that, among other services, access to family planning and contraceptives, there has to be information education dispensed as well, so that people can informed, uh, can make informed choices. Sorry. Um, under accessibility, the distance to and cost of family planning. Think of a setup where um, in rural setups, what is the distance to the nearest hospital? And does this hospital offer family planning? If you think of the religious owned facilities, especially those and, um, owned by the Catholic church, many hospitals will not offer any form of family planning save to teach you about safe days and um, things like withdrawal method but will not give you any other information on family planning they will tell you they do not offer that service but do they point you to the nearest facility that can do this and if in a rural setup um are this if not found, if these services are not found in such a facility, yet it is the only facility that is easily accessible to the community. What does this then mean? Those are questions we can think about. Also, for accessibility, services ought to be offered on a non-discriminatory basis with proper information. In our communities, we have adolescent mothers 
can adolescent mothers, you are already a mother. That means you're already sexually active. Can you access family planning services? In the Kenyan setup, um, for if you're under the age of 18, you can only access reproductive health services if you have the consent of your parent or your guardian. If I'm already a mother, who then is meant to give consent for me? So those are some of the challenges that we um, experience in our specific countries. Um, in terms of um, non-discrimination, when it comes to accessing contraceptives and family planning, what is, even if you're a young woman, you're a young man over the age of 18, and you walk into a facility and say you're seeking family planning, is it a safe space for you? So those are some of the challenges that come under accessibility. In acceptability, um, family planning is meant to be tailored to meet the specific needs and um, needs of communities and individuals. The bill under section 18 guarantees the right of every person to freely and responsibly determine whether to have children or not, the number, the timing, and the spacing of children. With regards to quality, and this is especially um, the case for communities that are economically disadvantaged, um, family planning available needs to be scientifically and medically appropriate. One of the complaints we get a lot in our line of work is that um, communities that are economically um, challenged, communities that are considered poor for all intents and purposes, do not have the same quality, for example, of family planning as um, a community, for example, that is served by a high-end hospital. There, people have more options. The bill also deals with the issue of assisted reproductive technology, ART. The bill defines this as um, fertilization in a laboratory dish of sperm with an egg obtained from an ovary, whether or not the process of fertilization is completed in the lab dish, test tube, or a surrogate. Um, I know recently under the very able stewardship of Mrs. Mwadumbo, there was, um, there was a training or I was a CPD on surrogacy. Um, the bill also mandates access to information and services for prevention, management, and treatment of infertility um, with persons with, with biological and medical issues affecting their fertility, and as well as providing mandates people to provide um, information on ART, the assisted reproductive technologies, and partner states are mandated to regulate and um, the use of um, ART technologies to ensure that um, the services provided are provided for both in public and private sector are lawful, safe, and effective. The bill also goes a step further to look at SRH for people living with disabilities. So um, states, member states are mandated to provide appropriate facilities, infrastructure, and information that protects the reproductive needs of persons with disabilities. Um, have you ever wondered how a deaf person is attended to in hospital? What if the deaf person needs to discuss their sexuality or um, reproductive health challenges with a doctor? Will you get an interpreter or will you try and sign it out? Um, the bill goes ahead to recognize the importance of protecting older persons who equally have reproductive needs. When it comes to maternal health, partner states are mandated to promote the right of every woman um, to experience safe motherhood, including access to information, quality services throughout the pregnancy, childbirth, and postpartum period with the desired outcome being that of the woman having a live and healthy baby. Um, the bill also looks to integrate and include preconception, prenatal delivery, and postnatal healthcare services in UHC programming, that is in universal health programming. And this would include um, matern providing maternal services as part of primary healthcare, making maternal um, services available and accessible, 
increasing access to skilled birth attendants and midwives, prevention of basic emergency and obstetrical gynecological conditions, vaccination of preventable diseases, as well as provision of information and education, screening, behavioral counseling, treatment, management of diseases and conditions that lead to complications and um, put um, that significantly lower the chances of a successful fertility and and the bill also goes ahead to look into mental health and postpartum complications that are usually associated with childbirth. So this is what has been deemed to be one of the more controversial clauses of um, this bill. So I will give you a short story into what has been happening with this bill. So in Kenya, I don't know um, if this happened in other countries, but I, it should have happened. Um, this bill was termed to be was termed to be the abortion bill, and that is how the bill has not progressed as at yet. So what this bill provides is to harmonize partner state laws on abortion. The bill um, provides um, to seeks to guarantee the right of every woman to terminate a pregnancy if in the health of a pro health professional, if in the opinion of a health professional, there is need for emergency treatment, the pregnancy is in, um, going to endanger the mental or physical health um, or life of a woman, and in, as well as provide for safe abortion in cases of sexual assault, rape and incest as may be, or as may be permitted by the law of a partner state. These guarantees access to um, post-abortion care pack and treatment as a health and life-saving medical intervention, notwithstanding the legality of the abortion or attempted abortion. So um, opposers of this bill, termed this the abortion bill, ran a series of propaganda um, on the bill. I am sure several of you saw it on Twitter a year or two years ago. But what is interesting is like in Kenya, all these things are already provided for in our constitution, yet we rejected or um, people pushed the government to reject this bill, yet it is provided for in our constitution under Article 26.4. In Kenya, a woman's life begins at conception, abortion is allowed under certain circumstances where in the opinion of a health professional, the life of the mother is endangered. And in Kenya, um, whether or not you have had a safe and legal abortion, or you went to a back street clinic, had an unsafe abortion, if you go to a hospital, you are entitled to receive emergency post-abortal care that is to be catered for, um, by the NHIF, the National Hospital Insurance Fund. Also in Kenya, accessing post-abortal care is also found, you can access post-abortal care even in faith-based institutions, including Catholic-owned institutions who do not offer any family planning services, or let me rephrase that, who offer very limited family planning services, but they are mandated by law to offer post-abortal care. So um, what would this bill, once it becomes law, what would it mean for EAC member states? It would address gaps in law for member states. For example, Burundi has no specific legislation on FGM, while Kenya has also no spe specific legislation on um, ART, assisted reproductive technologies. And we have just introduced a bill in parliament championed by Honorable Mili Mabona. Um, the bill, if it should become law, would frame state obligations under international treaties, treaties touching on SRHR, and it would standardize the regional approach to SRHR. So how can advocates engage with this process? Our ask of advocates today would be to discuss issues of law from an objective point. We do understand that some of these issues are very emotive, um, especially if you are 
um, a religious person, some of these issues can be emotive to you, but we would ask that people discuss issues of law from an objective standpoint and do not participate in propaganda around the bill, for example, calling it the abortion bill, while your own country laws provide for some of the things that you are saying should not be in the bill. And that is the end of my presentation. And I am sure there are no questions because I've been very clear. Angela. Um, thank you very much, uh, Angina. I love your optimism. Uh, however, there are already questions. Um, some have been posted in the chat section and some have been posted in the Q&A section. And uh, just to remind uh, members, um, this entire webinar will be available uh, on YouTube and a link there too will be available on all the social media, on all the East Africa Law Society social media platforms. Then um, for those uh, members who are not able to join because we have reached capacity, those who are present can inform the ones who have not been able to join to follow the proceedings as it is being um, streamed live on Facebook, on the ELS uh, Facebook page. Um, the questions are coming thick and fast. Uh, we shall start with uh, the question that has been directed to Dr. Ogada. Um, there's a question on uh, the lawmaking process. A member saying whether there is a procedure in law for the overriding uh, presidential veto on the proposed law, and uh, is that veto final? I don't know if you can hear me, Madam Charity. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for the question. Now, um, Article 63 of the ESC Treaty will answer that question in the sense that Article 63, uh, is it Article 63.2, says that even a single head of state refusing to sign on to the bill, that bill lapses, meaning that bill cannot proceed. It will uh, cease to exist as an item for uh, uh, the legislate, for the East Africa Legislative Assembly to consider. Uh, the member needs to understand um, Dr. Tari, um, your screen seems uh, frozen. Um, can the rest hear me? I don't know whether the issue is on my end. Am I audible? Yes, Angela, you're audible. Okay, okay. So um, Dr. Ray's screen seems to have been frozen. Um, as he addresses the issue, I think we have gotten the gist of the answer that for a bill to pass, all the presidents of the seven states need to... Chair, need did you to... hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, now you are back. Sorry. You're frozen for a minute and I got lost. So I was saying this, that there's a conceptual and legal difference between lawmaking at, dom at a domestic level and lawmaking at regional level. So that the overriding objective at international regional level is state consent. So if the head of state being one of the bona fides, heads of state, head of government, being one of the bona fides of uh, in international law, those who can bind a state to international law, refuses to append signature, then that state cannot be uh, lawfully compelled to abide by those provisions. And that is what is reflected in Article 63, that if a head of state refuses to sign onto the bill, then you cannot compel sovereign states to accept provisions of law. So I'll invite the member to look at Article 63. Thank you. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, Daktari. And uh, just to remind members, the East African, um, the EAC Sexual Health Reproductive Bill, as very well enumerated by uh, Ms. Muyanga, provides for several issues and not just abortion. And these issues are age appropriate sex education, menstrual health and hygiene, contraception and family planning, assisted reproductive technology. We also have uh, the men being considered uh, um, in this uh, bill, because normally when we have a discussion on sexual health rights or contraceptives, our minds just go to the, to the women. And of course, the bill also touches on maternal health. So there are um, several questions uh, on the Q&A section. And uh, the first one is uh, directed to you, Ms. Muyanga, and it is from Rachel Mboya. And the question is, does the bill address the issue of the right to abortion, especially in light of the overturning of the decision that was made in Roe versus uh, Wade? Um, Ngena? Okay, and, uh, thank you for the question. As you're answering that, uh, there's uh, another question um, touching on uh, the abortion aspect from Dr. Moza Jadid, um, asking us to enlighten on which law allows uh, post-abortion care in Kenya. Would this be the Health Act? Okay. So um, with regards to um, does the bill address issues of safe and legal abortion, I think it's important to distinguish because um, one of the misinformation that has been given around this bill is that it is promoting abortion on demand. It is not. It deals with safe and legal abortion and the um, circumstances under which this would be provided for if the life and health of mother, the mother are in danger and in the opinion of a trained medical professional. In the um, light of Roe versus Wade, um, for those who don't know, Roe v. Wade in America is what overturned um, the federal safeguarding of abortion in America. It had not yet been codified into law. So what has happened is that several states, I think around now, Nyokabi can confirm around 25 states in America are now um, have overturned protections around safe and legal abortion. That has not been affected um, in the, under the ESCSRHR bill. And in Kenya, for example, that still stands. Um, so yes, should the bill pass in Kenya, in our context, this would be only, it would only go ahead to bolster what is already there. And that the next question of what law provides for um, emergency post abortal care, one, the constitution provides for emergency care, emergency care, um, emergency medical care. Uh, post abortal care is considered to be one of um, the things that would need constitute an emergency. And um, if you look at one, the, the policy document for your NHIF, the Health Act, um, as well as the constitution itself, this is found there. Yokabi, in case you have anything else to add. Okay. Um, before Nyokabi <clears throat> chimes in, I hope Nyokabi, you have uh, collated the list of documents that you um, referred to as had been requested by one of um, our, our members. Then um, as you are giving us that, uh, you could answer the question on... Um, on whether the bill touches on uh, integrated HIV prevention, including the use of uh, PrEP, I think that is, uh, yeah, PrEP, and uh, also the question on, 
on whether the bill is framed in the manner suggested by the African Union through the Maputo Plan of Action on Sexual and Reproductive Health. This uh, CAC must not only be age appropriate, but culturally sensitive. With um, this additional component might assist in getting the bill into law. Okay, that's that's a question, but sorry, that's more of a comment, but you could address maybe the language in the bill. Um, Nyokabi? Um, uh, Mrs. Madumbo? Uh, Mrs. Madumbo, I will collect those uh, documents. I think I'd missed that uh, request, but I will do that immediately I finish speaking. Um, in terms of uh, whether, uh, the, just I read on what Ngena was saying around the provision of, of emergency treatment. Uh, so PAC is considered emergent treatment. It's actually needed to require, to, to save the life of the person who has undergone uh, whether it's an, a miscarriage or an induced abortion. And that is emergency treatment that's provided for under Article 43 of the Constitution, as well as the Health Act. And every person who undergoes an abortion will require post abortion uh, care. Even, yeah, considering here that actually abortion is a medical term that includes even a miscarriage. So that's why it's very important to ensure that um, the legal barriers in terms of language that is used. Uh, and we've seen this being used by anti-rights groups to make it look like post-abortion care is not health care. It's actually health care. And that's actually what we need to start looking at abortion as, as the lens, uh, abortion as health care. And it's not just this thing that is kept somewhere that should only be given to women when they are violated. So let me just get you the documents real quick. Huh? Okay, as uh, Nyokabi is collating the list of documents, um, Dr. Ri, uh, Dr. Ogada, there are concerns on the applicability or enforcement of the law, should it, uh, should it be passed? Maybe we hear your thoughts on uh, some of the, uh, on what can be done by member states when it comes to enforcement. And uh, this is open to all panelists, but we shall begin with the doctor. Well, once the bill has become an act of the community, then it can be enforced by the East Africa Court of Justice, whose mandate is to enforce community law. And part of community law is uh, acts that have been duly legislated and passed by uh, the East Africa Legislative Assembly. So the, the, the state, the individual state will be in violation of treaty obligations by not adhering to validly passed law by IALA. And enforcement can be sought through um, uh, the East Africa Court of Justice. Um, maybe in Ghana we can hear your thoughts on what can be done on the ground, knowing, um, bearing in mind that should this law pass, then it is a regional, um, a, it's a regional statute as opposed to a national um, statute. I think, um, sorry, uh, in the same room with your colleagues, I apologize. Um, I think, Angela, the correct question ought to be, how do we get the bill to pass? The bill deals with issues comprehensively that many state countries, including Kenya, has not dealt with. It sorts out, it, it provides a legal framework for many issues that are not dealt with at a partner um, country level. So the question should be, how do we get this to pass fast because of um, issues to do with SRHR are very emotive. Therefore, there's a lot of opposition. Currently, we can see what has been happening in Uganda. We can see what is happening in Kenya with the 
all these bills that are being touted as family protection bills, um, seeking to claw back provisions of law that are already there. So how do we safeguard what is already there? And in a setup like Kenya, um, the bill would only come to reinforce what is there. So we need to get the bill to pass first. Uh, have I answered your question? Um, I, I think that... Uh, Sorry, that you're could... muted, Mrs. Madumbo. Um, yeah, I think now I'm audible. Yes. I, I, I think the member who asked that question had already gone beyond the law being the, the law being passed. So now she's coming from a point of view that the law has already been passed. Uh -huh. So what happens if the states don't do anything? But I think in your response, you have uh, answered uh, Ruth Juliet's question, which where she was asking whether the, the can the bill pass? Will the president um, assent to the bill? Is the law a bit uh, late? Can I respond? Can I respond to that before Nyokabi comes on? Yes. Um, <laughs> um, so one, we need to put pressure on our states. We can only put pressure if we understand the provisions of the bill. We can only put pressure, we can only campaign for it if we as advocates have read it. If our professional bodies, be it um, the law societies of the respective countries, be it the medical associations of the respective countries, if they have read it, understood it, and championed for it. If at a personal level we are putting pressure on our local representatives and telling them we need this passed, but you can't do that if you don't understand the provisions of the bill and what it is coming to cure you will get swept away by the propaganda that will be on Twitter, the propaganda that will be on social media and any other space. So it is important to read, understand, engage with the process, um, and then put pressure on our representatives who will then now, one, on our representatives, two, on the technocrats, be it in the ministries of education, ministries of health, ministries of gender, put pressure on the technocrats who advise the president to actually make him see that this, him or her see in the case of Tanzania, to make them see that this is a bill that is needed. This is not a bill that is running an agenda. And then we will get it to pass. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Muyanga. Uh, now there's a question specifically directed to you. Uh, on the q and a section, and that is uh, by an anonymous attendee who's asking who would be the determiner of the appropriateness of the content of comprehensive sex education to children in schools within member states? Uh, Ms. Moyanga? Determinant, sorry. Um... As we said, comprehensive sex education is best in a school setup, one. Two, for there to be a comprehensive sex education curriculum, there has to be a policy framework within the Ministry of Education. That, those, that is a ministry that hosts everything to do with education, everything that is taught in schools. One, the Ministry of Education, two, the various directorates that are dealing with um, child protection issues, Three, the Ministry of Gender. There are several ministries that are, are involved and all these ministries have um, stakeholder participation. One, remember, we have said that the churches also are a great stakeholder in the education setup. So all these stakeholders are called into a room um, You are muted. Are muted? Yes, I muted myself accidentally. All these stakeholders, as I was saying, have a say in the curriculum. It is not somebody random walking into a school and saying, this is what I'm teaching. But the Ministry of Education is the one who would, or rather is the one that would facilitate the um, CSC because it has to be standardized across the country. Okay. 
Um, I hope the question has been answered. Uh, members, I can see that there are several hands up. Uh, this is your time. If you would wish to ask your question live, you can raise your hand, then you will be enabled to speak and you can ask your question um, to the panelists live. Um, Josephine uh, Mokeira. Josephine Mokeira, kindly unmute and uh, address us. Josephine Mokeira Onyengo. Um, Josephine, if you can hear me, kindly unmute. Okay, um, we have Brenda Mangongo. Brenda, you can unmute and address us. Your hand is up, Brenda Mangongo. Okay, I'm um, just when I have seen your comment. Um, Brenda Mangongo, you can address us. Okay, um, seems uh, it was also an accidental hand. Um, Walter Julius Carlos. Unmute and uh, address us. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, Advocate Walter Julius Carlos, uh, working at WGNR Africa as a youth SRHL program coordinator, but also a chairperson of the TLOS, Tanganyika Law Society Gender Committee. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the panelists for the very nice presentation, but um, just a piece of advice um, for all of us who have attended this session today, uh, just to make awareness on the bill, because uh, the issue here is that uh, uh, people are, not so many people are really aware about the about this bill, except for those who are working with the organization who are doing uh, or advocating for the SLHR. So um, I think it's a time now to make sure that um, we cover uh, a larger audience who are well knowledgeable about the bill and not uh, those who are opposing the bill, because even those people who are opposing, some of them, they are just opposing because uh, they really don't know what is uh, within the bill, but if they get a clear understanding on the bill, I think um, we'll be moving in a good way. Another thing I would also advise uh, the organizer next time, because uh, this is uh, it's the African community thing, maybe to mix the list of the panelists uh, from various uh, countries, if, if possible. Yeah, that's all. Otherwise, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Walter, for your comments and your proposals, which will be um, considered. And uh, especially for the, or the issue of the panelists, we shall uh, look into that. And then also thank you for throwing the challenge back to us that it is up to us who are knowledgeable on the bill to sensitize the other the other members of the East African law of, uh, of the East African community about all the other progressive and helpful provisions on the bill, as opposed to just focusing on uh, one or two provisions, uh, or as uh, Ms. Muyanga said, the propaganda on it being called uh, an abortion bill. Um, we have uh, Grace Chelangat. Grace Chelangat, you can unmute and address us. Hello, Madam Wadumbo, it's a pleasure to address you. It's sort of like an AOB we discussed about artificial reproductive health uh, arts, that is it. I would want you kindly to, within even outside this forum, if you could please give us the, the presentation that Madam Ngina was trying to refer to, it would really help me a lot. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Grace. Um, all the webinars that are um, presented courtesy of uh, the East African Law Society are available on uh, YouTube or in the on the ELS uh, YouTube channel. 
So you can just search on the ELS YouTube channel and you will find the, the recording of that, um, of that uh, webinar that was held in February. I think it was held on 14th of February. So that one is available, the entire recording. Um, Daktari, I can see your hand is up before we permit somebody else to speak, address us. Well, I had what uh, uh, Council Angina said in terms of uh, the content of the bill. And I will urge that uh, in our respective countries, let there be mobilization through civil society and other actors, doctors, uh, so that we get consensus on what the bill should look at, look like without watering down the contents. Uh, for this reason, we have a principle under the treaty called variable geometry. And variable geometry will be relied on by different countries depending on their uh, um, uh, understanding and appreciation of the bill. So countries that are more conservative will reject uh, what they don't like. Countries that are more accommodative and more respectful will accept what they will want according to the principle of variable geometry. That will mean that what we have now as the bill might be considerably watered down or accepted. So for us to maintain a core of what looks, uh, what the bill looks like now, or even improve on it, it will be for us to lobby at civil society level, use doctors, uh, lobby the council so that the gains so far are not lost. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tari, for the, those insights. Uh, Martin Lunalo. Martin Lunalo, you are unable to speak and mute and address us. Thank you very much, Angela. Uh, my name is Martin Lunalo, working for and with RICO, Protective Health Champions Organization Kenya. Uh, mine is kind of a comment. Like uh, it's 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 good that we are starting these discussions earlier. My worry will be how do we work towards understanding our 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 state's political languages. And how can we utilize on the political party spaces to ensure that the members who are the ones to propel this uh, discussion in the East African Legislative Assembly are not being harassed by their political parties or are not going against the political, uh, their political parties' uh, 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 culture or what they believe in. So I think it's very important that as we start at this level, for example, for us who are in this country, Kenya, knows that uh, how many political parties has nominated their representatives in the yala so it's easier for us to try and see who uh, who calls for who calls shots in those political parties how can we ensure that our language in this space makes sense to them so that uh, as as it's being tabled in the in the in the county in the in the east african assembly it doesn't get much of resistance from our own uh, uh, political spaces, more especially those that are retrogressive towards SRH. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Martin. We have uh, noted your comments, and it just goes to speak uh, to the point that all of us um, can lend our voice to getting the to getting the bill the bill passed. If we continue with this uh, discussion and we continue sensitizing members, and I like the fact that you have uh, brought about the political aspect of this bill, because sometimes as advocates, we tend to be uh, to focus more on the legalism. and we forget that for a bill to pass, it is a legal process and it is also a political process. Um, yes, Dr. Tari. Um, Dr. your hand is up. I think that was in error. Sorry. Oh, I, I thought you wanted to repeat your your comment in French, which would no, no, be no. Allowed. It was not lowered. Thank you, Chair. I'm um, sorry. 
Thank you. Um, to the member who had asked about the the link to the previous session, it has been shared um, in the comment. Uh, sorry, it has been shared in the chat section. Um, Jacinta, you can, if you look at the chat section, you will see the link to that particular discussion on um, assisted reproductive technology. And uh, then to the member who had uh, requested for the list of documents that Ms. Uh, Nyokabi had uh, referred to, um, that list has also been posted on the chat uh, section. Um, then there is also another question that uh, had been posted earlier on the chat uh, section, and that is on whether the bill um, provide, has any provisions on zero rating or tax exemption for sanitary pads and uh, HIV medication. Um, Nyokabi, maybe you can you can answer that, Nyokabi. And uh, members, we still have a bit of time. So if you would like to address us, if you'd like to give a comment or question live, you can raise your hand and you will be permitted to talk. Uh, so just to respond to that, as well as another question I've seen in the chat, um, no, it does not provide for zero rating of uh, menstrual health products. Um, and it does also, also doesn't speak very specifically around zero rating of, of drugs. However, the obligation that it places on partner states is to ensure there's availability of those things. I think the way you bridge that gap and not the difference. I'm not sure if somebody was trying to talk. No, 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 yes. no. So, yes, so, so no, in terms of the, the actual zero rating doesn't remember taxation is also handled uh, at ESC level through our common management, what's its name, ESC common management, customs management, and of course, each of the past partner states has their own taxation laws. There's still significant work to be done within the partner states, and this is how the bill, if it, if it legislated for access to menstrual health products would help. The fact that menstrual health products would, would be placed as an obligation, for example, at, at that level, would mean that within our individual state, then we can still be able to advocate for either zero rating or provision of access to free services. Currently, uh, I know at least in Kenya, the uh, menstrual health products are supposed to be given to a certain level of school going girls. Uh, and this has been done at varying levels of success in uganda i know it's still a significant problem right here in kenya it's still it's a question that's still under uh, litigation that's been that's pending litigation including removal of the question of tax um there was a question also around whether the bill provides for integrated integrated approaches to mm -hmm. hiv and specifically around provision of uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, it doesn't go to that granular level but it does provide for SRH services, an integrated manner in which SRH services can be given, not just for persons living with HIV or to avoid HIV, but beyond that, because SRH is not simply confined towards HIV. Now, we do have a fairly robust ESC uh, HIV, HIV Community Management Act, uh, which I've also placed in the chat box. And that speaks a little more around what kind of services should be provided to ensure that uh, new infections do not occur. However, we need to look at the SRH bill as looking at be as beyond. Yes, it speaks towards um, HIV, but it's also looking beyond what HIV uh, programming would require. However, uh, in terms of the granular phase uh, and pro provision of uh, PrEP, that is already provided in the 2017 to 2022 document, as well as the the one that has just been launched last year by the by the EEC. Um, thank you very much, uh, Nyokabi. Um, this has been a very insightful session session for all of us. Um, so maybe we have your final thoughts. Um, we start with you, Nyokabi. Uh, final thoughts. Uh, okay, uh, I, I felt like uh, Dr. Ogada should have gone fast <laughs> in French. <laughs> oh, is, 
Stopper, maybe. <laughs> anyway, um, I think first it's to really thank you, uh, Angela, as well as the entire ELS fraternity for allowing us this opportunity to, to learn from each other around uh, provision and protection of SRHR rights within uh, our space. Uh, a huge thank you to the, the participants who have been very engaging. At some point, I was just looking through the comments and uh, it's clear that there's a very demonstrated interest in this. So thank you for giving us, all 1,000 of you, for giving us your time. Uh, I think my parting shot is that uh, there's a lot of work to be done around this. Like, we've painted the context. We see the problems that we are trying to solve. And the law is one of these problems. And I know there's a lot of apprehension about, one, the kind of political climate we are in, especially now because of the anti-rights uh, sentiment that's going on. But I think it's just to say that that's more work on us, especially as advocates, that we can ensure that we are giving accurate information, ensuring this rights compliance by governments, by those, by our duty bearers. Uh, so I think the work is there and we would be happy to partner with you on, the, on this. Thank you again uh, and have a lovely afternoon. Um, thank you, Nyokabi. Ngena, let's have your final thoughts, Ngena. Um, I think I associate myself with Nyokabi's sentiments. Everything she has said, I will not repeat. Um, I would like to thank everyone for giving us their time, their attention. We know as advocates, time is money. Um, with regards to the work, as Martin Lunalo has said, we need to understand the context we are operating in. We need to understand the political language. We need to be strategic in how we approach um, how we approach agitation around the bill. Um, it is not just a CSO agenda. It is not just something that rests with CSOs only, but it is all these things we have discussed today affect each one of us at a personal level. Um, we, I am assuming many of us have the resources to have these services. Imagine the women, the men who don't have resources to access these services and yet the law is not on their side. So um, let us engage. Um, let us not feel it is not our problem. It is all our problem. And thank you to ELS for providing Kelly with this opportunity to speak to its membership. Um, thank you very much. Um, or should I say, um, I've forgotten how to say thank you in French. Um, uh, Daktari, over to you. S'il vous plaît, address us on français. Um, merci, madame. Uh, Madumbo, uh, to the audience, uh, thank you very much. My parting shots will be um, the Anyang Nungu case uh, decreed and properly decreed that regional integration uh, is people-centric. So this is a call for action for us to um, go back to the original intention of the ESA treaty that we as a civic, as, as a civic uh, a polity in the region ensure that the ESC treaty is about us. So go back to your individual countries, in your individual communities. Let's ensure that the beneficence of this bill are maintained. Let's lobby, let's talk to everyone that we need to talk to. Uh, since uh, we have the Francophone uh, audience, merci pour uh, avoir attendu ce webinaire. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, hopefully, we'll be meeting you in subsequent engagements with our various committees. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ogada, Ms. Moyanga, Ms. Njogo, for your very insightful uh, presentations. Um, members, let us remember that we are the voice, we should be the voice of reason within our spheres of interest. If there's any mis misinformation um, about the bill or any other legal issue, it is our duty to, to debunk some of these myths, um, especially regarding sexual rights and, and sexual health and reproductive rights. 
um, as a parting shot, let us remember that the ESC Reproductive Health Bill provides for so much more and so very many productive, I mean, progressive provisions, for example, menstrual health and hygiene, age appropriate sex uh, education, you know, family planning, assisted reproductive technology. So let us amplify some of those provisions as opposed to letting the narrative just flow that it is an abortion bill because the decibels regarding abortion are very loud and uh, there is not as much um, emphasis on the other positive aspects of the bill. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you all for your participation. Uh, we have gotten very many inquiries regarding the free CPD points. Um, members, just to notify you, almost uh, 2,000 members um, had registered for this webinar, but the capacity was 1,000. Uh, we have been looking at the attendance and uh, almost all members have attended up, up to the end. So the, the points will be awarded randomly because we have all uh, qualified for the points. So the, the points will be awarded randomly. And uh, the, there, is, uh, there is a location for CPD points for Kenyan lawyers and for points for all the other lawyers in Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi and uh, DRC. So there is an equal allocation of points. So um, the, the regardless of whichever nationality um, members are the majority, the point allocation is, uh, is uh, equal. So members, uh, as you retreat to your various spheres of uh, influence, let us continue being human rights champions. And let us say a prayer so that uh, we be awarded the points because the ICT will award the points uh, randomly. With that, um, and these points are only limited to lawyers or advocates, basically members of the national bars. So if you are in another profession where you get the CPD points, um, because this is the regional bar association, the points will only be available to members of the legal profession. With that, members, let me thank you very much uh, from the bottom of my heart, from my heart of hearts for your participation in the, this uh, webinar. To the speakers, um, you are all experts in your fields and thank you for simplifying this um, topic that seemed so strange, but now you have broken it down to, uh, to a level where we can all understand and you can all be SRHR advocates. So with that, uh, have a lovely evening and enjoy the rest of your afternoon to our Muslim uh, brothers and sisters, um, Eid Mubarak, albeit uh, belatedly. Merci beaucoup tout le monde and au revoir.